Greetings. This is part two of our Cinematronics rip-off arcade game repair. Last time we fixed the power supply, which was missing the 5 volts. We tested it in the cabinet and it looked like the game was playing blind. What that means is you can hear sounds in response to button presses, but nothing showed up on the TV. Well, this on the vector monitor, I should say. As I explained, the, the, the vector monitor, unlike a raster monitor, has the, uh, has the beam deflection controlled by the CPU, by the game itself. So instead of scanning lines sequentially, it just has a beam that originally points right in the middle of the screen. You see a white dot. And then as the game progresses, it sends data into here that deflects the beam in the X and Y directions. Now what that causes is something called vector chatter, which means when you turn it on, you can hear this noisy chattering coming from the uh, chassis over here. And that means that it's getting deflection information coming in. Other things to look at, we saw last time that the uh, neck tube lit up, which uh, all that means is that 6.3 volts AC are reaching the neck. This whole thing is essentially a vacuum tube. A vacuum tube needs a heater voltage to get the electrons running, and that's what the neck tube glow indicates. Other than that, it needs a high voltage, which is coming from here, and connected over here. I also did not see or hear any high voltage. You usually get a crackling when you turn on a CRT, which means the high voltage is coming up. I didn't hear any of that either. And last but not least, whenever we turned it on, it blew the 25 volt DC resettable breaker on the power supply immediately. And a few seconds after that, it blew the minus 25 volt DC uh, circuit breaker. So, uh, what gives? Well, circuit breakers trip, that means there's a short here somewhere. Well, what, they, what it means is it's using excessive current, which is most likely caused by a short somewhere. The first difficulty I had in, in diagnosing this was this board didn't really match the schematics that came in the ripoff manual. And uh, after a lot of searching, I pulled a more recent Cinematronics game, I think it was Star Castle, and the changes are that the original schematic showed the flyback tra transformer and associated components over here. And if you can see, there's still holes in the board where they were originally mounted, I guess. But at a later time, they came up with an encapsulated high voltage module, which is just plugged into the main board over here. And some other minor changes. Uh, there were different voltage regulators on the uh, in the schem in the original schematic this one seemed to be somewhat simplified but I started to poke around the question was what is making the 25 volt DC breaker trip well obviously it's something that's sitting on the 25 volt DC line and I checked around I poked around and finally, this took me a while, but I decided to spare you the boredom. So I get the multimeter set to uh, continuity. And what we have over here is a bypass, an electrolytic bypass capacitor that's sitting right on the incoming 25 volts DC. When we test this, we get two ohms. That can safely be considered a dead short somewhere. But there's lots of things connected 
to the 25 volt DC line. My first suspicion was there are some uh, tantalum capacitors which can usually be identified by their blue color and strange shape. Right here is one. I was guessing and hoping those when they go bad they short generally. But I measured every one I could see on the board and they were all good. My next suspicion was the 25 volts DC feeds a 15 volt regulator which is way back in here but of course that's soldered in and uh, I wasn't really looking forward to several cycles of desoldering components and testing them out of circuit so the idea was okay what can we unplug to see if uh, that uses a 25 volts but we can unplug without having to desolder anything. So after looking at the schematics, the first thing that comes to mind, see there are two heat sinks on the side and those hold the vertical and horizontal driver transistors, two each. And they use the 25 volts DC. So, first thing to do was they are conveniently plugged into the board and the other thing that uses the 25 volts is the high voltage supply over here and we shall disconnect this too now why do you ask am I sticking my hands in there without properly uh, discharging the tube and the answer to that is this tube's been sitting for weeks, months, or years without having been powered up. That's why I skipped that step. And you can laugh when I jump to the ceiling. So anyway, with that disconnected, let's measure the same thing again. And turning on the meter, let's see what the actual So we're getting a reading in the kilo ohms now. So obviously the fault is either in the high voltage supply or in one of the transistors mounted on the side. So let's plug things in. First the high voltage supply, because if that thing's dead, I think, uh, I don't think I can get a replacement. Well, I probably could if money were no object, but hey. So, with the high voltage plugged in, we measure it again. And we are still in the kilo ohms. Phew. It's not this. Well, we don't know if it works, but it doesn't have... The short is not in here. We then plug in one of the transistor pairs. And measure again. We are in continuity. And looking at the resistance, it's also in the kilo in the hundred in the hundred kilo ohms range, just like the other one. So it's gotta be one of the transistors in here, and we can easily verify that by plugging it back in and measuring yet again. Yep, we're back to 2 ohms. So, uh, we have fault isolated this. Well, fault isolated as far as the short is concerned. This doesn't mean that if we find the shorted component that it'll fix it. But uh, at least it should prevent the breaker from tripping. Here's the heatsink with the two uh, transistors and it just terminates in the uh, six position connector. So uh, which one do you think's bad? Let's see, I can't see a date code on this one but it looks a lot newer than this one. This has a date code of 13th week of 1980. 
So we're going to take this guy out. No soldering required. It, there's basically a TO3 socket on the other side. And uh, remove the socket. And test. This is a 2N5876. So let's see what this one says. Which is completely unreadable. See if that becomes visible. <laughs> Looks like this one's good. It's a PNP, and the values look good on it. So uh, let's pull the other transistor. All right, I pulled the other one. And I should have looked at it more carefully. Didn't see it at first, but... No, I didn't see it at first. I thought I saw a date code on here, but there really isn't. So, purely judging by its appearance, I figured this one was newer and maybe better. It's a Fairchild. I don't even know if Fairchild still makes transistors, but anyway... This has got to be it, because if this thing is good, that means, well, we got some sort of an interconnect problem with the plugs. So, let's see. All right. Thinks it's a resistor. A 0.3 ohm resistor. Let's try that one more time. It's still a 0.29 ohm resistor. Well, we found the bad part. So I got a bunch of digging to do now to see if I... I don't think I have the exact same transistor, but uh, I'm going to do some... Uh, substitution checking here, pulling data sheets on the transistors that I have, and hopefully I'll have something close enough to this one that I can replace it with. I found a replacement transistor. The uh, specs seem to be pretty close. Generally when you look for a replacement you want the specs of the replacement ideally to exceed the original it really wasn't the case here. The replacement I got had a lower frequency response, but it was still in the megahertz. And uh, for switching deflection, that is in the kilohertz. So the change in frequency shouldn't really make a difference. But of course for the test now, we are set to continuity. So measuring it, nothing, well, no uh, continuity, and if I switch it to an ohms reading, we are getting, we are in the hundreds of kilo ohms. Everything is plugged in, so we should be good. But the grins, since the minus 25 also blew, Let's see what the resistance of that is. And that's part of the uh, second heatsink. Let's see, what pin does that come in on? 
Thus, pins eight and nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And eight reads eight reads in in kilo in low kilo ohms. Quite different, but that's because that that feeds something totally else. Different part of the circuit, so uh, I don't know. Maybe missing the 27 volts caused something in here to start drawing a lot more power from the minus 25 volt line, which eventually made it trip too. But we won't find out till we put it back in the game. One other thing to note was the yoke over here, which has the deflection coils in it. This was basically it had slid all the way back here. It was flush against the connector. And what I mean by that, see how the tube sticks out here and you can see the uh, the glow? Well, originally when this, when I got it, this was slid back all the way, covering this part of the tube entirely. So this cabinet was dropped pretty severely causing this thing to uh, slide back. I tightened this clamp a little bit. You got to be very careful because you're tightening a clamp on glass and if you get over enthusiastic you'll break the neck. But other than that everything's now plugged in. I guess it's time uh, to carry this thing to the cabinet in the garage and plug it in. Alright, everything's plugged in. Both power and data, new transistor, yeah, so uh, let's have a, keep those two breakers in focus and see what happens. Here goes power, three, two, one. Okay, I could hear some high voltage crackling, very little, but I could hear it. And I definitely hear vector chatter. So, you can't really see it, but it's working. The uh, low intensity stuff in the middle is really low intensity and the flying ships are high. I have to read the manual to see if there's like a balance adjustment for low and high brightness. But it's working. So let's at least play a quick game here. And then we're done. Well the object of the game is you've got fuel tanks sitting in the middle, those triangles. And those guys are coming to rip you off. They fly and they grab one and take off the screen. And when they got all of them, it's game over. And you're supposed to shoot them, asteroid style. So, go.
time, this was done in 1980. Not a lot of user interface or eye candy, just the game. I don't think it keeps high scores either. It didn't even show us that we had credits. Two more tanks left. Oh, three more. Bonus level. What does that mean? We got more ships showing up now. Well, they're not stealing, they're just shooting at me. Oh, come on. Okay. I'll let him steal. up the last one. Okay. That's it. Doesn't even say game over. Just gives you your latest score. Alright, there you have it. Saved another game from the landfill. These, uh, these are becoming uh, these are becoming somewhat rare. Keep in mind that Atari, Sega, and others that did vector games bought off-the-shelf monitors, self-contained. But the uh, Cinematronics had to roll their own. Of course, they bought the tube. This one's a Sylvania, but they did the chassis. They they designed the chassis themselves. And yes, parts are getting kind of rare. It's a cool game. Thanks for watching. Do all the good stuff, especially a thumbs up and nice comments. And we'll see you next time.